that is why you are called Jehovah. That is why, Lord, that is why you are called Jehovah. What you say, Lord, what you say you will do. That is what you will do, yes, Lord. That is why you are called Jehovah. That is why, Lord, that is why you are called Jehovah. That is why. That is why you are called Jehovah. You've got the power, you've got the power to say. You've got the power to do. Yes, that is why you are called Jehovah. Truly, Father, you're a covenant-keeping God. We well, thank you, Father, because your faithfulness is not in question. We well, thank you, Father, because your ability is not in question. And most especially, we thank you, Father, because your love and your willingness to do what you say is not in question either. And this morning, we worship and we honor you for who you are. Not because of ourselves, but because of who you are. We thank you, Father, because indeed you're the entrance of your word brings light and brings understanding also to the simple. Father, we just ask today that for every one of us that is here under the sound of my voice, including myself, Father, Lord, I ask that we all will receive a full measure of understanding and revelation of your word this morning in the name of Jesus. And Father, we will not stop at receiving revelation. We will go forth and bear fruit, an abiding fruit indeed, with the word that we receive from you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to be talking about the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. I've been pondering about this for the last there are three weeks there about. And I realize that it's a word we lose, use very loosely. Is it always easy to believe that God is faithful? Yes or no? Or you're sitting on the fence? There's no fence here. You are either yes or no. So I'm going to take it from everyone. It is no. Is it always easy to believe that God is faithful? No. Okay. Let's look into his word. Hallelujah. So he is faithful. Are you? That's the word he has for us today. In Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, the Bible says, Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Paul said in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, he said, verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So what does it mean to be faithful? Because as I said, it's a word we just say loosely. But have we ever stopped to ponder what it means when we say God is faithful? Today God wants to help us to delve into that word. To be faithful means, one, adhering firmly and devotedly as to a person, cause, an idea. It means to be loyal. It means having a full of faith. So being faithful is not just doing what you say. It's actually believing also. So there's a component of faith in the word faithful. If you're wonderful, you're full of wonder. If you're faithful, you're full of faith. It is being worthy of trust. So when you say somebody is faithful, they're worthy 
of trust. They have earned your ability to trust them. It is belief. It is being reliable. Faithfulness is being consistent. So you're hearing your own words coming out here. Being consistent with what? Truth or actuality. Synonyms of the word faithful are loyal, true, constant, fast, steadfast, staunch. Every one of these words are, are dictionary definitions, but they define who God is. God's faithfulness is essential to his being. It is the very essence of his divine nature. To be anything short of that is impossible. That is why Paul said in Timothy, he cannot deny himself. His faithfulness, thankfully, does not depend on our being faithful. He's faithful regardless of where we are. He would love us to be equally faithful. However, God does not measure what he does based on how you treat him or how you respond to him. He's faithful. He cannot deny himself. The Bible says in Psalm 89 and verse 8 that he's clothed with faithfulness. It is such a part of him. It is such, it's an intrinsic value of who he is. There are people, for every one of us sitting here, there's something about you that is totally peculiar to you. Every single one of us has something in us that is peculiar to us. As God is, his faithfulness is such a part of him. You cannot separate his faithfulness from him. No matter what happens, he's faithful. I'm going to ask us a couple of questions. In Numbers 23 verse 19 also, to buttress this, the Bible says when you read the story in Numbers 23 and Numbers 24 of Balaam and Balak, it's a very good story to read and truly see and gain insight on the faithfulness of God and what we said in the song, what he said he will do, that is what he will do. So Balaam said to Balak, you want me to curse these people? I cannot curse whom the Lord has blessed. And I can only speak that which he has given me words and utterance to speak. This is after Balaam had had an encounter with God and saw that God is to be feared. And his final step and staying point in, 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 in Numbers 24 verse 2, he said, you have finally opened my eyes to see that which I did not know. He had at different points, not necessarily obeyed God. He didn't truly understand and appreciate who God was. And God said, no, whom I have blessed, no one can curse. And Balaam said in Numbers 23, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? I want you to own this word. Because if you can take this into your heart. It will keep you in check and help you to know that if God has said something to you about a situation, it is a matter of time that it will come to pass. It is a matter of time. It will come to pass. What is God faithful in? So many things, but I'll just pick out a few things this morning. Number one, he's faithful in being true to his word and his friends. When you read in the book of Genesis, the story of Abraham and Lot, we see that God had told Abraham that he will be faithful to him. He'll keep him. And he had said to him concerning Lot, when Abraham began to negotiate with him about Sodom and Gomorrah, God was aware that Lot, Abraham's family, was in Sodom. He was aware. And when he decided that, well, Abraham, you negotiated up to, with me up to the point. Are there up to 10 people righteous? There were none. And he had to destroy that, that nation. But he remembered his promise to Abraham. He remembered. That is the faithfulness of God. It always comes to remembrance. And the Bible says that it was because of Abraham that God remembered, that God saved Lot. In Genesis chapter 19 and verse 29, the Bible says, and it came to pass 
when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. I want you to know that your being faithful to God will put you in a situation where other people will receive salvation on your behalf. It was not because of Lot. It was not for the sake of Lot that he was rescued. It was for the sake of Abraham. It was because Abraham was a friend of God. It was because Abraham had proven and been tested and seen himself to be faithful to God, giving God everything. God said, because of that, he brought Lot out. Had Lot been faithful to Abraham? He hadn't been. And again, you see there, it's not because of the other person. God will be faithful regardless all the time to what he has promised. We see it in the case of David. When God said to David that as long as you keep my statutes and my commandments, there will not cease to be one in your lineage on the throne. What I love about God is because he's faithful to do what he says he will do. Many a times God puts a condition to his promise. If God does not put a condition to his promises, he's bound to keep his word. And then there are many things that we'll, we'll, we'll do that will put us in trouble. I'll give you an example. God said in his word concerning children, it's one of the commandments he gave, honor your father and your mother that it may be well with you and your days be long. I keep saying this to parents, the reason why you, you discipline your children and you raise them in a particular way is not for your sake, it's for their own sake. If God says, honor your father, it's a commandment by itself, but he's made a promise to that, but the condition upon that promise being fulfilled is them honoring their parents, which is why we can petition God in situations. Because he's faithful to keep his word. He's bound to keep his word. He must honor his word. And so in some instances, a lot of times God will specifically declare and say, if you do this, I will do that. That is why it's a covenant. A covenant is a binding agreement between two people. But God will always keep his covenant. The question is, are we keeping our side of the covenant? God is faithful in warning and preparing us. I like the fact that we said that he's faithful. And because you have seen him being faithful, you believe him and you do what he says. I want you to think about that again. Do we actually obey God all the time? Again, we're coming to this issue of obedience. And we're going to see that the reason why we don't obey God all the time is because we actually don't believe in what he has said. Because if we believe that God is faithful, it means that from the beginning of time, God has warned that nobody is entering heaven with any spot, without, with any blemish or with any wrinkle. So if you say you believe him, why are we not coming under the blood and under his grace to live a life of holiness? It must mean that we actually don't believe but you see, he's faithful to warn. He has said that the way to heaven is a narrow way. And few shall walk in it. You know, when God makes out judgment, you cannot say he's not been fair. The song says, ascribe greatness to the God our rock. His word is perfect and all his ways are sure. A God of justice, with a God of mercy without injustice. Good and upright are you. He cannot, you cannot say he's been unfair. If you're true to yourself. He has warned you severally. By the time God is meeting our judgment, you yourself will know that I deserve it. If we're being fair and true. Good and upright is he. A God of faithfulness without injustice. God is saying to you and I today, from time I have warned. Another example of this, he said to Abraham in Genesis 15, when he has said to Abraham, I will do this for you, I will bless you, and Abraham said, what is all of this if I do not have an heir? God looked at him. Hmm, interesting. So all I've given you up to this point, and I've even told you that I would bless you with an heir. You're still saying, 
okay, I, God, I'm not. So does that mean you don't believe me? He then said to Abraham in Genesis 15, in, in Genesis 15, he said to him, your descendants are going to be in captivity for 400 years. He told Abraham that. When that word was fulfilled, Abraham was not alive. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 41, I want us to read it ourselves together. Exodus and chapter 12 and verse 41. Let us see the fulfillment of that word. Because sometimes when you're reading the Bible, it seems as if some things just jump out of the blue. They didn't come out of the blue. If you go back, that's why you always have to read the word in context. If you go back, you will see nothing came by surprise. He had warned. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 41. The Bible says here, And it came to pass... At the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. How many generations had been in captivity up to that point? But many people might not have remembered that God had told Abraham 400 years at least. I want to use this as an example for us in our lives today. If God has said to you, my child, I'm going to do this particular thing in this particular way at this particular time. We need to learn to rest in that. Because you frustrate yourself when you begin to have an expectation outside of what he has said. What he said he would do, that is what he will do. So why do we look to other things outside of what he has said? So for those people who had been living between Abraham and the fulfillment of this word, if they had remembered what God said in, Exodus, in Genesis 15, they would have just known to just rest. And look at it. When the day of that word to be fulfilled came to pass, did it take God anything to do what he did? No. He did it. Because it was time. He is faithful, meaning that he's consistent, he's committed, he's loyal, he's able, he's dependable. What he says he will do. He's faithful in keeping his promises. I say good or bad in terms of outcome in inverted commas. To you and I, the outcome may seem to be bad. But as far as God is concerned, sometimes some things have to happen that look bad in our lives, for God to bring out the best in you. In 1 Thessalonians 5.24, the Bible says, He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. In Hebrews 12.29, the same Bible tells us that God is a consuming fire. What does that tell me? <laughs> If I'm doing certain things that he has warned me not to do, when he is faithful to deal with me. So you see this faithfulness matter that we say, ah, he's faithful, he's faithful, he's faithful. It is more than he's faithful. You need to understand that he's faithful, I better be careful. I better be careful to stay on his side because his faithfulness is absolute. He's no respecter of persons. And in his faithfulness, God will look into your eye and chastise you and punish you and cry with you. But he will still do what he has to do because he must keep his word. But he will cry with you. He will feel the pain with you. He will still pat you. But he will still do that thing he has to do. So he is faithful in disciplining us. The same way he withholds is the same way he will lavishly release that punishment if he has to. And the same way he will lavishly release the blessing or the good things when he needs to. And so, he's also faithful in allowing us to face hard times. I want us to know that there is a reason and a purpose for every hardship you go through. Kobe talked about suffering. Many of us cannot pray that prayer 
the courage to pray, God, let me go through the sufferings as Jesus did. Not many of us have the courage. Even when your mouth opens to say it, your brain begins to check you. Are you sure you know what you're asking God for? Some things we ask God for, we don't even know how he's going to carry those things out. When we ask, and when the things begin to happen, you're wondering, and God is saying, did you not ask me to do this? Now, I didn't tell you the process I will go through. But again, because we know he's faithful to do what he says, we need to trust that regardless of that process, the outcome will bring glory. And we need to hold on. Joseph must have really, really wondered at times. This dream I had, and this place I'm finding myself, they don't look the same. Oh. What's happening, God? What was, what was it that made him hold on to God? He knew God was faithful. David was anointed king at 17. He did not attain the throne until 40, 23 years. But God was faithful. Did God tell him the day he anointed him when he would actually ascend to the throne? He didn't tell him. He would not always tell you. But we need to know that if he has said it to you, he will do it in his own time. Job. <laughs> wow. Job said in Job 5.19, he shall deliver you in six troubles. Was Job lying? He, he knew he had been delivered severally into many issues. So when Job said, he shall deliver you in six troubles, yes, in seven. However, no evil shall touch you. Now, I want us to ask ourselves this question. Job said, he will deliver you into six troubles and seven, but no evil shall touch you. If you think about what happened to Job, will you not call that evil? Would you not call that evil? If that were to happen to any one of us today, we will bind the enemy from here till tomorrow. To lose all your children in one day, to lose every material thing you have in one day, to be afflicted physically with boils. Is that not evil? But yet, Job said, no evil will touch you. We need a revelation. The same revelation that Job had. Because as I stand here, honestly, I cannot say I understand fully what Job is saying. But I want to be a child to receive the word of God as it is. If the Bible tells me that no evil shall touch me. In spite of the negative things that happen in my life, I want to accept that. But I need God to help me. Because in my understanding, what happened to Job was evil. But yet Job himself, not any other person reporting on his behalf, Job says. And that is probably what gave him the strength. Job had an understanding of the faithfulness of God. That no matter what I'm seeing happening around me, it does not take from who God is. It does not take from his ability. It does not take from his willingness. It doesn't reduce his love for me. That is what Job understood. In Psalm 119, number 75, David said, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Wow. <laughs> Do you see what being, when we say God is faithful, <laughs> we need to sit with this word. In your faithfulness, you have afflicted me. How is that? Was David afflicted many times? So he wasn't lying. But he said that God was faithful. And so which is why I'm saying that the Lord would allow us to face hard times. Because he knows to bring out the glory and to increase virtue in you and me, we must go through the fire. Jesus never said it would be an easy walk. And this is why I'm saying he consistently through his word, from Genesis to Revelation, God warned us it will not be easy. And he showed us in the life of people. So if we say we know that God is faithful, why do we complain 
when we're going through challenges. It goes back to the beginning of what I said. Maybe we don't actually believe. Because Joseph had an understanding of this. He was able to go through the prison, go through Potiphar's house, go through being sold in slavery with grace and with dignity. For you to go through the trials of your life without sinning and still praising God. Paul and Silas were able to praise God in prison because they had an understanding of the faithfulness of God. The three Hebrew boys, same thing. What did they say? Did they know that God was going to deliver them? They did not know. Did they know that he could if he chose to? Yes, they did. But they knew one thing, and the writer of Hebrews made us know, that the fact that some things don't happen to you today in your life, it does not mean that God has not fulfilled his promise. He says, on the other side of eternity, there's greater things waiting for you. The three little boys knew. He said, well, we won't bow. And if we need for God, he can. But if he chooses not to, we will still not bow. So we have established this morning that God is faithful. But for us to live true lives of victory, it's not enough for you to know that he's faithful. You also, I also, need to be faithful like him. So I want to ask us a few questions. I asked the first one, which was, what does God being faithful mean? What does God being faithful mean to you? Now we have touched on a few things. Ask yourself that question again. What does it mean to you? Do you know that to be true? Do you know that he's faithful? Do you actually know that? Paul said in 2 Timothy verse 1 and verse 12, Paul said, for this reason, I also suffered these things. I'm amazed that every time Paul talked about the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, glory, he attached it to suffering. God is saying to us as a church, my children, grow up. We need to start eating strong bone. Enough of the milk. Come to the Lord, he will bless you. Come to the Lord, you have two cars. Come to the Lord, you have three cars. Come to the... No. That's milk. We need to begin to start thirsting and hungering for the things that differentiated these people. Paul said, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded. The Amplified Version says, I am fully persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Key words, I know whom I've believed. I am persuaded. That means I can, you're not moving me from that point. Like God, he's staunch, he's fast. We need to become like that in our walk with him, in our service of him, in the way we live our lives. He says he's able to keep. He can. In Romans 8.28, we quote it a lot. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. We know. The truth of the matter is that your ability to be faithful in God is tied directly to how much you know him. You cannot be faithful to God if you don't know him. You can't be. It is what you know, the revelation of him that you have received personally. I cannot go off Carrie's revelation of God and be faithful to God. I need to receive my own revelation of him to be faithful to him. You need to own your, person, your relationship with God. You are responsible to nurture it. We can give you all the tools. We can give you all the word. If you don't take ownership of it, you cannot be faithful to God. It's not possible. And guess why? Because you have no capacity in you as a person to be faithful. 
It is what I know of him. And how do I get to know him? I need to know his word. I need to walk with him. I need to listen to his voice. I need to obey him. I must have faith to be faithful. So for me to be constant, for me to be consistent, for me to be committed, I must believe in him. And I must believe his word. If he said to us in Isaiah, he's going, he said there, there's a woman, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. That word was fulfilled. Why do we think that Jesus coming back is not going to happen? And I say why do we think? Because if we know he's coming back, we will live our lives differently. Why are we trying to run around to hear and to learn from people who, are, who, did, who did eschatology and want to know when does it look like when Jesus is coming, blah, blah. When the same Bible told us, no man will know when he's coming. So why are we wasting energy on things? When his word has told us, you will know. Do you see how we waste emotion, time, resources? Because we have not believed his word. If, he's, if he said he's coming back, he's going to come back. But again, he's a gracious father. He said there will be signs. Are we not seeing the signs today? We are. So what should my response be? I need to get my house in order. I want to ask you this morning. If Jesus were to come today, are you ready to meet with him? Think about it. Have you lived as if he can come? We are all Christians. But some will be like the five foolish virgins. And some will be like the five wise. I ask you again. What does God's faithfulness mean to you? He's coming back. And he's coming for a church without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle. Have you checked your garments? Or do you just wake up and move every day? Are you checking your garments are well ironed? Wrinkle? Is there a stain? on it. Are you that watchful and mindful on how you... Because if he says a spot, he didn't say a smear. It is easy to see a smear. You may miss a spot. You have to be diligently watching to see a spot. So I must search my life on a daily basis. Lord, I thank you because he wakes me up in the morning. I give you praise for life, but I need to search my life as I move into the day. He's coming back for a specific type of church. Now, who are we to begin to say, you know, God is not really that wicked. He's actually this. He won't really do that. That means you don't know he's faithful. What he said he will do, that is what he will do. So why are we trying to put words into his mouth? I want us to quickly look at the scripture in the book of Psalm 50, and then we'll go to pray. Because I think this is very important for us. Psalm 50. And I think this is actually key because the issue of the faithfulness of God is in question in many of our lives. And that is why we keep assuming that God didn't really know what he was saying when he said certain things. In Psalm 50, from verse 21, the Bible says, These things have, hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thought that I was altogether such as yourself, but I will reprove you. Now, <laughs> in, in the Amplified Bible, it says, These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought I was once entirely like you, but now I will reprove you and put the charge in order before your eyes. God said, He's saying to us, You think I'm like you. Stop thinking in your understanding. I have told you what I will do. That is what I will do. 
Don't try to reason me away. Don't try to rationalize my word. His word is clear. There are no gray areas with God. It is clear. So this is a charge to us this morning. That because he's faithful, he's actually going to do every single thing that is in this word. So I need to know what is in this word. And I need to ask myself, do I really believe? Now, like I asked us, is it easy to always believe that God is faithful? No, it is not. When you are discouraged, when things happen, you're on trial, at that, in the midst of the darkness, the noise of life sometimes makes you question the faithfulness of God. What should your response be? Truthfully, don't feel condemned when you're there. Your response should be fall on your face and say, Father, help me. Because for me to stand here and make it seem as if you must be faithful or believe he's faithful, regardless of your circumstance, is not fair and is not true. But you will have times when Satan himself will keep nagging at you and questioning you. Like we said, like we see he did with, with Jesus. What did Jesus always have to do? It is written. He always came back because it was like, ah, this thing, this voice is, con <laughs> it is written. But if he didn't know the word, could he do that? So you need to know this thing for you. Because that is what will keep you steadfast in the midst of the darkness. It is what will make you stand and say, I will not compromise, no matter what. Today, this morning, God wants to release a grace upon us to be faithful as he is. Jesus was faithful, and we can be equally faithful. I want us to rise to our feet this morning. You know where you are. And I want you to go to the Lord. If you have been struggling with knowing that God is faithful, I want you to talk to the Father this morning. If you know that you, 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 he has been calling you to that place of you being more faithful to him, you know the capacity and the place he's calling you to. It could be in your marriage. It could be even in the way you work in your place of work. It could be in your service to him. God is saying, you have not been faithful. It could just be in the way you relate with him. You know, I want you to go to the Father yourself. Grace is available this morning to be faithful to him. What is that challenge that you're having? The psalmist says, the song, the song says, great is thy faithfulness. That's what Jeremiah said. Ah, after all the trials, he said, great is is your faithfulness. I want you to talk to the Father this morning and just say, Lord, help me. I need you to help me to be faithful. I want you to thank him also for being faithful. Even when you are faithless, when I am faithless, he remains faithful. Father, we thank you. If you're asking God, you want to go up to a, a, a deeper level of relationship with him this morning. You want to commit yourself to God, dedicating yourself to him, holy, as he has to you. He's loyal. I want you to put your right hand upon your heart this morning. If you're making that commitment this morning, Father, I want to go up higher with you. I want to be faithful as you have been. I cannot do it, Lord, but I'm not satisfied with where I am. I want when Jesus comes or when you call me home, that you will be able to say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let that be your testimony concerning my life, Father. Let that be your testimony. I want to hear that from you, Lord. If that's your heart cry, just put your right hand upon your heart. It's not a must. If that's not it, don't do it. But if that's truly your heart cry this morning, just come to the Father. It is you and him. It is you and him. And he will be faithful. It says, faithful is he who has called you to this place. He will do it. Faithful are you, Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. 
Father, I pray for every one of us here today. We ask, oh God, that everything that has stood as a distraction, Father, this morning, help us to turn our backs on those things. Father, we pray, oh God, that you would give us a fresh revelation of what it means to be faithful to you and an understanding of what your faithfulness means to us. We thank you, Father, even for the, for the opportunity, oh God, to learn of you. And we thank you so much that you are coming back for your church. Father, for each and every one of us here, we pray that we will be that bride, that church that you would meet when you come. And that you will take us because you will find us a church waiting for you. You will find us a people without spot, without blemish, or without wrinkle. Father, we thank you so much for you being faithful. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen.